we want to welcome to the third panel um, discussion and uh, we were, we're going to have it as a breakout session A, Urban Challenges for the Anthropocene. Everyone, welcome. And we say goodbye to Rodrigo as well. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and we are going to welcome uh, uh, Mrs. Kemi Ayanda um, and um, uh, the highlights of uh, her uh, experience are the following. Kemi is a results-driven leader with 22 years multi-donor experience with DFID, USAID, uh, EU and UN, uh, United Nations, successfully delivering development efforts in health, education, agriculture, security and stability, and good governance. She has led strategic thinking on multiple initiatives. She translated this into successful implementation of strategies and frameworks to improve the impact and reach of development initiatives. She currently leads efforts in conceptualizing the knowledge and creative economy for NEOM, N -E -O -M, working closely with multiple stakeholders and partners. The title of her presentation is Considerations for a Creative Economy in a Greenfield Anthropocene, a case study of NEOM, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And we welcome you, Kemi. Um, uh, she is actually joining us from Saudi Arabia. So um, we're happy to have you here today. Um, next, I will introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Gunter Koch. Um, uh, Gunter is president of the Humboldt uh, Cosmos Multiversity. Uh, Humboldt, we would say, right? Humboldt Cosmos Multiversity, a discourse and education platform established in Tenerife, uh, Spain. By education, being a computer scientist educated at the Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology, he enlarged his competences first as an entrepreneur in software business, uh, specialized in software engineer in industrial automation, in um, a next phase as head of an international competence institute in software management set up by the European Commission and European IT industry in the 90s. His engagement in sequence from uh, 1998 was heading Austria's largest R&D organization, ARC, and today it's called Austrian Institute of Technology, AIT. Um, there, he developed and introduced intellectual capital reporting as a method of knowledge and science management. After he had left ARC in 2003, he initiated a high-level expert group under the auspices of the EU, EU Commission on the subject of intellectual capital reporting. During this period, in his private interest, for more than a decade, he established and managed an art gallery in Vienna specialized in Art Brut. In consequence of his disengagement together with Andrea Puntari, he co-founded and now precise the GRASP Network Association seated in Vienna, the objective of which is to promote artful thinking as also in non-art domains. So welcome, uh, Professor Gunter Koch, to uh, our uh, breakout session A today. Um, I'm going to also introduce Kathy Garner. Um, Dr. Kathy is an honorary researcher at Lancaster University in UK. Uh, she's a non-executive director at the Centre for Aging Better in London, the Scale-Up Institute of the UK, the World Capital Institute in Mexico, and the Council on Health Research for Development in Geneva. As a CEO of Manchester Knowledge Capital, she established a major innovative city partnership for economic and environmental development. Welcome, Kathy, to our breakout session eight. Thank you. And last but not least, we um, we salute the <laughs> the birthday boy today. <laughs> he is Professor Francisco Javier Carrillo, and um, his bio goes um, a little bit like this. Javier is passionate about knowledge as leverage uh, to the human condition. He is president of the World Capital Institute and emeritus professor of knowledge-based development at Tecnológico de Monterrey. 
He is a leading international expert in knowledge-based development. He has recently co-edited the WCI reports on knowledge for the Anthropocene and um, he, the city preparedness for the climate crisis. His latest book is A Modern Guide to Knowledge. And he's definitely not only the president of the WCI, but the one who made um, all these um, Knowledge City Summits possible. We are on the 14th edition of it. So that is a, a little bit more to congratulate um, Dr. Carrillo today. OK, welcome to the breakout session A, Dr. Carrillo. And uh, without more ado, let's um, get started with uh, your proposals, your presentations. We're looking uh, forward to it. And uh, we give um, uh, way to um, uh, Dr. Kemi Ayanda uh, because we have that order, the order we, um, we we read the bios with, OK? So um, I, um, I give the floor to uh, Kemi, and um, the presentation is already there. Are you handling it, Kemi? Yes, if I may. OK, well, I think it's perfect. We can see it on presentation mode, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Blanca, and um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's, a, it's such a delight to be here and to be able to join um, colleagues from across the world to share um, uh, on this really interesting topic. Um, about the creative economy in a greenfield Anthropocene. Um, and basically, I'm going to be talking about the case of Neom. Neom is a cognitive city um, built from the scratch. So we've got the benefits of the greenfield. And I'm going to be sharing some of that with you today. Um, so today, we'll just cover um, a bit of the context around Neom. Um, and also talk about how this is relevant um, when we talk about knowledge and knowledge economies. And um, I'll share a few, a few of the current efforts at NEO, um, also stemming from the lessons or learning from other knowledge economies, and also give some uh, closing remarks. I think one of the important things I need to mention is um, the other day, I was with a colleague trying to have coffee, and um, we said to talk about the metaverse, and the question I had was, um, are we going to have roads in the metaverse? Um, for me, um, these are the kinds of discussions we tend to have at NEO, um, because then we have this blank canvas with which we can create um, from the scratch and hopefully um, um, create change in terms of how we talk about economic development and um, opportunities um, across board. So in terms of NEOM, um, NEOM is an amazing greenfield opportunity. And basically, uh, NEOM aspires to change the course of history. Um, it's built, um, it's going to be a, a city, a cognitive city, is one of the four giga projects um, as part of the Vision 2030 for Saudi Arabia. Um, I'm not sure if you are all aware, but Saudi Arabia has been largely dependent on oil as a, as a natural resort, um, resource. But then in 2016, um, the Vision 2030 uh, goals were um, uh, sort of uh, determined, basically, and NEOM is one of those four big, big scale projects to start to look at a new model for sustainable living, working, and prospering. So the vision for NEOM is to be the land of the future where the greatest minds and the best talents are empowered to embody pioneering ideas and exceed boundaries in a world inspired by imagination. Um, and so NEOM is one of those projects that aims to diversify the economy of Saudi Arabia, basically to do things differently. And one of the things for us is that we have that amazing greenfield opportunity. We are starting from the scratch, so we have the opportunity to do things the right way and hopefully learn from um, you know, other e economies. So here, I just want to share with you a quick one minute video that gives you uh, more context about NEOM. Perfect. Thanks. Yes. We got it. It's in our genes. It's what makes us human. Now we have a chance to change everything. Let's change water so it flows forever. Energy so it powers your life sustainably. And mobility so cities become playgrounds. Let's change the way we feed the world. 
designed to live with nature and create factories that make the future better. Let's change learning so it's lifelong. Technology so it predicts our needs. And let's help prevent more illness than we need to cure. Let's change the way we think about money. How we explore the world around us and how experiences come to life. This is where we can change it all. Neom made to change. So, um, apologies for that hiccup, but basically that was a quick video to show um, what the broad uh, vision is um, around Neom um, to sort of change how things, how you sort of concept, conceptualize a city and how you sort of implement it. Um, to start to think and do things differently. Um, and some of that, for instance, when we talk about the Anthropocene, um, we do realize that there's been a lot of um, adverse consequences um, based on human activities that is sort of affecting um, our world today, um, causing a lot of habitat loss, global warming, uh, changes in the soil, um, you know, and oceans and the atmosphere, um, you know, efforts that are actually affecting endangered species as well. And so um, with Neom, what, one of the things we're trying to do is to, yes, diversify the economy, come up with um, economic development policies and strategies that makes um, for competitiveness, but also in a sustainable uh, manner. The question is for us, can we, be, can we prosper and also uh, be sustainable? Can we do um, economic development in a way that um, allows for green growth? Um, so those are some of the questions we're trying to answer with Neil. Um, in talking about knowledge, because for us, we feel like in getting to that point where we make useful use, um, make a, a good use of the of the resources around us, we have to sort of leverage knowledge, knowledge from existing economies, um, but also um, knowledge from across different experiences and expertise um, based on the global talent that is coming to implement the vision of Neil. And knowledge is a key ingredient for that, right? So um, here we've defined knowledge. We've also sort of defined a knowledge management strategy for Neom um, from a corporate perspective. But beyond that, because Neom is also a city of sort um, or even a country, because Neom is going to have several regions, and I would um, share a, a few videos about that, um, then we need to start to talk about the knowledge economy or the creative economy, um, as the case may be. Um, and, and this is the focus for uh, the next few slides. Um, and so basically, um, when we talk about the knowledge economy or the knowledge society, there are distinct um, different concepts. But then for us, we are looking at a, a very um, integrated approach to make sure that we duly address both concepts in a holistic and comprehensive manner, um, and also to leverage the potential overlaps and uh, synergies. Um, here, of course, you, you all know that um, there have been building blocks to this knowledge economy as defined by the UNDP um, and the World Bank based on the Global Knowledge Index and Knowledge Economy Index. And um, for us, we are also pushing the boundaries beyond this initial building blocks to, to ask ourselves critical questions and to situate this um, in the, context, uh, in the context for Neom, given that we have that blank canvas and the greenfield um, uh, opportunity um, to make real change um, occur. So far, and this is very preliminary, we've come up with these five um, pillars and building blocks with which we want to explore the knowledge economy at Neom, um, looking at human capital development, um, infrastructure. Here we look at physical infrastructure, um, ICT, but also looking at virtual infrastructure, for instance, um, when we talk about innovation, um, economic regime as well. Uh, on the economic regime, for instance, we're not just looking at the popular traditional GDP measure, but also looking at green growth. Um, and I know there's been a lot of debate around, should we say green GDP or green growth or other kinds of um, uh, uh, terms. And we are currently exploring that to sort of come up with like something that really captures um, a way to, um, you know, measure development, but in a way that is uh, sustainable and sort of does not take in, that takes into account all the, um, you know, uh, impacts on the environment um, as well. And of course, we've got the enabling environment um, element. 
One of the things that is really critical is also, as we talk about Neon, we've got nine vision themes that really, um, unlike your typical city or country, we are looking at concepts around talent, innovation, financial sustainability, livability, environmental sustainability. How do we ensure that new um, fosters social progress, inclusiveness, uh, diversity, equality? Um, how do we make sure that this is a lean government? How do we make sure that the quality of government services and the policies are those that sort of um, enable us to do, um, you know, uh, you know, to sort of build an economy that is competitive, but also protects the environment? So these are some of our key considerations. And we've, like I mentioned earlier, we've sort of tried to harness lessons from successful knowledge economies um, in terms of what works, what does not work quite well, and sort of trying to see how we can push the boundaries when it comes to innovation and, and creative thinking. So I'm just going to rush through this because I know um, I'm mindful of time. Um, but of, of, of course, we also look at the concept of and the um, inter, in, uh, integration between information, creativity, as well as knowledge, and how that contributes overall um, to the knowledge um, economy. Um, then in terms of the specific efforts at NEOM, we're looking at specific institutional arrangements that ought to be in place. Again, leveraging the fact that at the moment, we don't have any um, structures, we don't have any existing policies. Um, it's an opportunity for us to start to design and come up with policies, frameworks, um, enablers that sort of help us protect the environment, help us, um, you know, uh, you know, be competitive, but also sort of give a due cognizance to um, the potential impact on the environment and about that. Um, and then um, we we also want to make sure that whatever we're coming up with are adaptable and flexible to sort of accommodate the, dy the dynamism and the uncertainties of the world or, or the global economy um, that we have today. Um, and then uh, we do sort of also know that we have a unique opportunity because I mean, Neom is planning to, is, is an ambitious project planning to do what has never been achieved anywhere in the world. And, and I will show you some of the videos that give you a sense of some of the regions that are being uh, developed and built at Neom. And so this gives us an, an opportunity to change and you know, leverage a lot of knowledge, but also sort of document the legacy in terms of our process and our journey um, as we you know, uh, implement this uh, ambitious um, vision for NEOM. Um, so in essence, um, these are three um, of the regions that are going to be built or developed at NEOM. Um, the line is going to be um, 200 meters wide. It's going to be 170 kilometers long city um, running on renewable energy and no carbon emissions at all. Um, it will be it will set the standard for urban living and lifestyle uh, for about nine people, uh, nine million people, um, with only 34 square meter uh, footprint. It's going to be 95 percent of the area will be set aside for natural environment. Again, this is um, going to be phenomenal because it's something that is really pioneering in terms of um, giving due considerations to the Anthropocene. Um, again, and then you look at Trojana, it's going to be um, a, a region of Neom that will be set upon the mountains, um, which, you know, giving you a, a unique top tier destination that blends and de uh, develops a natural environment um, and, you know, gives you six major developments based on real and virtual advances in engineering and, and technology. And then we have Oxagon, which is more like the, if you like, the commercial uh, or industry um, region, um, basically bringing about new concepts where people, industries and technology integrate harmony and nature. Um, it will have cutting edge methods uh, from the uh, secular economy and industry 4.0. Um, I'll just share with you two quick videos um, on this, uh, on two of those A revolution regions. in civilization is taking place. Imagine a traditional city and consolidating its footprint, designing to protect and enhance nature. The Lines communities are organized in three dimensions within five minute walk neighborhoods. Travel end to end in 20 minutes. Designed by world leading architects, the line is 500 meters tall, 200 meters wide, 170 kilometers long, and housed within an elegant mirror glass facade. The line is designed as a series of unique communities providing equitable views and immediate access to the surrounding nature. At the heart of the globe's key trade routes, a place for commerce and communities to thrive. The Line, 
the city that delivers new wonders for the world. Imagine a place that provides everything your business needs to break boundaries. A curated landscape of advanced industry that closes the loop and drives circularity. To create a clean energy system, minimizing waste and maximizing output, where you can swap disposable for renewable. This is Oxygen. Thanks to state-of-the-art robotics, AI, machine learning, and other game-changing technologies, this is the place where manufacturing is being transformed, resulting in new levels of efficiency and unlimited possibilities. Through advanced manufacturing methods, we'll create green industries of the future with sustainability and reusability built into their DNA. Because any business destined to change the world must also protect it. A leading hub for research and innovation will bring the brightest minds together to solve the world's greatest challenges. Accelerating ideas from labs to market and attracting top talent to be part of a vibrant ecosystem. Oxygen will be home to the world's first fully automated port and integrated logistics hub with a regulatory framework to promote faster, seamless trade across the globe. It will comprise the world's largest floating structure, creating a new paradigm for living and working on water and an oceanographic institute for pioneering marine research so we can best protect the pristine waters of the Red Sea and beyond. This is a cognitive city that not only adapts to your needs, but will learn to anticipate them. Redefining tasks so that you can focus on the things that matter. A place with unrivaled livability, where people, industry, and technology come together in harmony with nature. This is the place where ideas can change the world. This is Oxygen. Right, on, and on that note, um, just a few closing remarks. Um, um, we do recognize at NEOM that we have an ideal um, uh, opportunity, a unique opportunity for us to create that ideal Anthropocene and bring that dream, um, you know, that we all crave for um, into reality. Um, we've learned from uh, key top knowledge economies and we're still learning. Um, we do um, recognize that um, uh, there's a lot of uh, new measures that we can you know, uh, and frameworks that we can, uh, you know, engage. For instance, when we talk about economic development in terms of policies, institutional arrangements, frameworks, um, we recognize that we need to um, create the right environment. We recognize that we need to collaborate and partner with uh, top um, uh, groups and think tanks across the world to be able to bring this um, vision into reality. Um, and on that note, I would say thank you. And um, I'll be happy to discuss a bit more and uh, answer any questions. Back to you, Blanca. Thanks a lot, Kemi. Um, thank you for um, all the visuals that you present that are uh, challenging us today to think about different futures and the ideal Anthropocene. Um, Kemi is joining us from Saudi Arabia, and I give way to Professor Gunter Koch um, right now, if you can start your presentation. Gunter, um, very much welcome to start. Are you joining us from Tenerife or are you joining us from Vienna? I'm joining from Tenerife. I'm just okay. trying to find my <clears throat> presentation. Uh, okay. Since we have a little bit, we have a little time. I hope that it. Uh, I will not consume too much. Uh, Kemi, when we uh, discussed your uh, approach on uh, this uh, future city in the desert, uh, one of our colleagues from the board. Uh, told me that there is an alternative approach, which I think for the sake of discussion would be very much interesting, which is, uh, let me continue with the presentation, the vision of a city which is called Oroville. I don't want to go in too much details because we have not the time, but it's a, a total alternative because it's a, a, also the idea of a future city uh, placed in uh, India. Uh, the original idea was uh, brought forward in already in 1964, and then it became uh, real in 1968. And the idea was uh, put forward by a lady, which is presented here. 
Her name is uh, Mira Altassa. Her uh, parents are from Egypt and Turkey. Uh, she was born in Paris and grown in Europe and had a background in philosophy and uh, let's say, uh, in an Indian uh, philosophy, which brought her to the idea to create a city, which uh, she says belongs to nobody in particular, belongs to humanity as a whole, uh, but it must be the willing of uh, those living there to service uh, to the divine of consciousness. So you see there is a spiritual approach to this. And uh, she says that Oroville will be the place of an unending education of constant progress and a youth that never ages. And the third statement she made was that she wants to be the bridge, the city wants to be the bridge between the past and the future, taking advantage of all the discoveries from without and from within. Oroville is, will boldly spring towards future realizations, and Oroville will be a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human uh, human unity. So I don't want uh, to oppose uh, what you told us, but I think uh, we might have the opportunity to discuss alternatives. Now let me enter in the proper part of my presentation. Uh, the question is how green is a city? How can you measure this? And uh, the uh, approach taken is uh, one which was published uh, five years ago. And you see from the presentation here that at that time, the methodologies we had at hand in order to define what the greenness of cities are, is uh, has not been very well developed yet. There was a tool which was called Tripedia, and Tripedia was uh, a tool by which you could measure the greenness of a city by measuring the green surfaces parts. So you can go to this tool and can find different cities. Uh, the two I selected were the one where the, the greenness factor is very high, the green view index, and this is Tampa, interestingly enough, and the lowest in the ranking is Paris. Now I will go further uh, in, uh, making this presentation with reference to a place I'm born, which is called and was a long time to be called the the capital of um, the green capital of Germany, which, by the way, is this uh, at the same time, the capital of the Black Forest, which is a smallish city uh, of uh, more than two, uh, around 250 inhabitants, which is a city called Freiburg. Uh, the reason why I put forward this uh, this uh, template is that um, the development of the city over the last 40 years, uh, I could, I was at the very start, I met the later mayor of the city who was a member of the Green Party in Germany. And uh, we had some work to be done in common whilst I, in the period when I lived there, which was until 1993. And after this, I changed my uh, working uh, situation uh, moving to Bilbao in Spain. Uh, what I, I I build a relationship between this city of Freiburg, which you see on this map, which is very hard to identify on the left side, uh, and on the very right side you see Vienna uh, as the capital of Austria. This map is from a period before the uh, or at the time of the Napoleon Wars in Europe. Uh, until that time, the city belonged for 400 years to Austria, to the Habsburg monarchy. And after this, it uh, became part of a German fiefdom. And why I show this uh, relationship is that, interestingly enough, the two places, Freiburg and Vienna, are both seen to be leading in uh, being green. Uh, the Earth argument, uh, Organization uh, identified uh, the world's 10th greenest cities in this year. And yes, the first place was taken by Vienna. Vienna also uh, made the, made the uh, competition in uh, to be the, the most livable city in the world, which was uh, a competition by the, uh, raised by the economists. Now, I'm going back to Freiburg and 
uh, the one takeaway for this uh, presentation and for our discussion is since the mayor of the city was a member of the Green Party, he was very much affiliated with uh, the foundation of the Greens in Germany, which is called Heinrich Böll Stiftung. And they, uh, they provide a very uh, excellent and intensive list of publications on what can be done uh, for urban development. And the one key message they bring forward is you have to build alliances. We had today already the discussion that one of the biggest complex challenges is really fighting uh, the climate change. And uh, the method which is, uh, which is offered here and which is recommended here is really uh, that different interest group, different political groups, different uh, uh, groups of the civil society should work together. And there's one organization which is really uh, but pivotal to, to this movement in Germany, which is a German Zero. I just would want to lose a few words. German Zero is mainly uh, financed by Patagonia. Uh, those of you who are living in uh, South America, Latin America, certainly have learned that Patagonia is the one company which decided that all of their profits have to be invested in uh, future uh, projects in fighting the climate change and uh, supporting sustainability. 98% uh, of the uh, of the uh, of uh, the capital the company has has been uh, brought to a foundation, which is the Patagonia Foundation, and only two percent remains with the owner of uh, who had. For, uh, we created this uh, organ uh, this company some 50 years ago and this had uh, what is very remarkable because it shows that it's not only government who have to take care in making the change happen uh, as i said uh, patagonia is uh, supporting german zero what is uh, german zero uh, they are interested in using the power of civil society and it's very interesting that the, the, the tool they use is a late legislative package, what they call it, uh, including 200 policy measures and having included 262 experts to uh, develop this package. Uh, as you can see uh, on, the, on the map of Germany, there are uh, uh, up to 70 different teams working within Germany. Some 25 cities have engaged uh, more than 1,000 volunteers are within this movement. Uh, members of the German parliament uh, have been addressed and uh, out of the uh, consist constituencies in Germany, out of the 300, around 162 have been uh, committed to this movement and uh, very high ranking political decision makers have, in, have been engaged. Now, I don't want to go into the details because uh, they are addressing not only the different subjects of uh, sustainability policy. On the right side, I have listed up the toolbox they offer. That means that for each of the, of the uh, issues they are addressing, there is a tool. And this brings me to the, uh, please only look to the right side of this picture, brings me to the discussion, what are the tools by which we can measure the greenness or let's say uh, the potential and the success of uh, developments of cities uh, going towards uh, to become a green city, a true green city, and not just uh, by greenwashing explanations. Now, uh, I jump over this because we have little time. Uh, the one thing I would like to tell you at the end of my presentation is that uh, these uh, tools and methods currently are collected by a project which has been set up by IEEE. Now, IEEE may not tell you anything, but it's a uh, it's the world's largest engineering and natural scientists organization. Originally, they devoted their um, strategies to standardization only. Meanwhile, they are also engaging in uh, identifying what are the methods and tools by which can be applied in order to make the change happen within a short amount of time, namely between uh, until 2030. Okay, uh, I think I, I like uh, to end up here, hopefully given some uh, food for thought, some food for discussion. And this is the last uh, 
page of my presentation. Thank you very much for having followed my, my uh, explanation so far. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Professor Gunter Koch, who is uh, joining us from Tenerife in the Canary Islands uh, in Spain. Uh, yes, there will be um, a very interesting discussion on, um, as he mentioned at the beginning, um, the, the desert possibilities for um, creation of new environments, certainly knowledge-based environments. And right now we want to uh, give way to um, uh, Dr. Kathy Garner's presentation. I think Kathy is joining us from somewhere in London. If you're comfortable, Kathy, the floor is yeah. yours. Yeah, I, uh, I think actually that the majority of my early slides have already been taken by the presentations that we've already seen today. So I am going to rush through that and get to where we should be looking at the, the future. Um, but my future is very much embedded in taking us forward from the present. Uh, it is not a leap uh, into uh, an unknown future. So I'm uh, my focus at the moment is all about preparedness for the uh, climate crisis and what how that is going to affect us. So that's my kind of focus of interest. But in, in next slide, please. Thank you. Um, as we heard from David, actually, in the keynote uh, address, um, urbanization is continuing to rapidly expand and by uh, 2050, uh, almost 70% of the population will be living in cities. So we have a, a major challenge on our hands to know how we are going to adapt those uh, cities. And the fact that the majority of that growth is coming from uh, in Africa and Asia, and what we've heard from, uh, unfortunately, Immaculata's difficult presentation, the amount of displacement that is actually happening in Africa already is going to be crowding into our cities. And the big challenge, of course, is that every city is not the same. A city placed in the desert there with desert storms or Venice, one of my favourite cities in the world, which is succumbing to flooding even in uh, this day, um, they, they all need different ways to adapt uh, and some may actually go out of existence. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, nobody will doubt this, I think, but climate change is here now uh, from fires uh, that wiped out a whole town in Canada, uh, Lytton, uh, last year to the floods in Pakistan, where some 33 million people were affected and over 1,500 deaths. So we are here and now in climate change. Um, and the challenges it brings us, next slide, please. The challenges it brings us are multiple. Hotter temperatures, more severe storms, droughts, rising water, loss of species, not enough food, health risks, poverty and displacement. These are all pretty challenging factors. And as David, I think, has must have been looking over my shoulder and seen my presentation. The next slide, please. Natalie, yeah. <laughs> the risks that we face are actually circular and cumulative. They are not individual. So hotter temperatures or rising water, um, as, as uh, an earlier presentation said, you know, you can go from, I think it was Beth that said it, she could go from burning uh, fires in one part of the US to rising floods in, in New Orleans, etc. But uh, this, this diagram developed by the Met, uh, the Met Office in the UK is really fascinating because it really shows the interaction of climate change with so many of the other unsettlements, if we want to call them, or, or unsettling situations that we have at the moment. And this is, this is cumulative and circular, which means that the effects are unpredictable in many senses. We can't really um, predict because each and every context will have a different uh, interaction uh, in that their context. But it does does actually suggest a downward spiral of urban life and an increase in, in strife. 
uh, significant impacts, of course, were felt on people's health, food insecurity, spread of disease due to pandemics, reduction in clear water, clean water and um, sanitation. And it's a vicious circle that keeps increasing the need to adapt while at the same time actually decreasing our ability to do so as we deal with individual problems. As we've seen of the spend on the pandemic that we've suffered over the last two years, we've spent, an, uh, in the UK, we spent an absolute fortune dealing with that, which is meaning that it's diverting uh, money from climate change. So adaptation, I believe, is absolutely essential. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's a definition. Uh, I'm not sure that polar bear really wants to be walking in the streets of New York, but that's what you might call real adaptation. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> For real ad adaptation, uh, I think as Beth has pointed out earlier in the presentation, we have to really have uh, a, a systematic approach to this which is not firing only on taking uh, economic drivers but, or environmental drivers, but is actually all three of these are working together. Now we can talk about whether this provides sustainable development or not, but these three pillars for me are absolutely critical for any uh, human uh, settlement that we have these in balance and we are thinking, as we've seen earlier, the social side of it tends to get the least attention. And this is actually where the greatest harm is actually happening. Uh, and if we don't get this, I mean, uh, it, we are going to be in a very difficult place. But this is not an equal uh, address for each city. The balance may be different. Shrinking cities in the north, uh, we're already seeing cities that are actually losing population. Uh, and how do they adapt? We're seeing the rapidly growing cities with many informal settlements that David himself talked about, and those that are particularly hazardously located, such as on the coast and in uh, on estuaries. And many, many of our major cities are because of our previous um, adherence to uh, trade over water. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what do we learn from the past? Well, we learned from the past that actually we are going to suffer these, these terrible things. Uh, droughts in history killed uh, over 11 and a half million people in 50 years and 3 million in China alone. Uh, the tsunami that happened in the Pacific in uh, 2011 and hit the Fukushima power plant, uh, you know, was not prepared for it, and neither it was it expected to happen. Um, but while it was not climate related, it provided the, the vital importance for early warning systems and would uh, mitigate huge expense that had to follow that, that absolute tragedy. And then Paradise, the village in California, uh, which was burnt down in 2018, uh, 153,000 acres were uh, of 240 square miles were burned to the ground, caused all by a spark from a power line. Um, now, the homes have been rebuilt, um, and in fact, it is even hotter. But it's hotter now because it's a hot housing market as one of the fastest growing cities in California. So places can regenerate, but they do tend to favour those with the most resources. Uh, next one, please. Uh, I'm going to rush on through. I hope I'm not taking too much time. Um, we all learned uh, from the pandemic over the, uh, the 20, 2020 onwards how different our cities could become. Some were good. We all took, bike, took on our bikes. We all cycled. Uh, well, maybe we didn't all cycle, but many of us cycled. Uh, we were able to walk out with the children. But uh, it also actually totally changed how uh, cities might develop in the future. Next slide, please. And, you know, there are visions from the left to the right, and the right vision uh, on the right is uh, Ebenezer Howard's uh, vision of a garden city 
which would talk about the 15 minute uh, 15 minute city which which was developed in 1891 uh, to address the fact that everyone was actually moving to the city and the people who wanted workers on the land were not able to uh, hold those on the land and uh, Ebenezer Howard came up with the idea that the city would be um, could be half and half. It could be growing its own food. It could be working on the land. It could be a greener place. But it's taken us a little while, uh, given that was uh, in the 1890s, to come up with that idea um, and adopt it. Next slide, please. Thank you. And one of the trends that we're seeing at the moment is what one of our authors in the book called bunkerization. And here, herein lies a challenge. Uh, we don't have the misquoted Darwinian saying now the survival of the fittest. It's actually the survival of the richest. And this is a worrying, um, a worrying uh, development. And this book that I picked up recently called The Survival of the Richest is absolutely amazing in what uh, the story that it tells in that the tech billionaires were escaping wishing to have a meeting like uh, Aspen or one of these the cities and invited the author along. And um, basically they wanted to him to say, where could we where, where, where could we actually find a safe spot to hide from the geopolitical risks that we're actually facing? Um, such as Peter Thiel, uh, who is in New Zealand, or Elon Musk, who wants to go to Mars. Uh, very interestingly this week, Jeff Bezos has just said that he's going to follow the Bill Gates approach to his money, which is good news, I think, for the world, that he is going to put it into practice. And now he's perhaps been up in his own spacecraft and seen how small the planet is. Perhaps it's brought him to that conclusion. Um, and could we be on the edge of a new era? Could we be thinking like Polanyi's great transition? Um, things change fast. Next slide, please. A very famous author, Edward Glazer, wrote The Triumph of the City in 2011. He's just published The Survival of the City in 2021. Ten years seems to have made a huge difference in the thinking of how cities would, would operate. And we ourselves have published this city preparedness for the climate change. Their cities are forever changing, um, <clears throat> but not always for the better. So urban inequalities, I think, are a major, major challenge for us, as we've heard today. And actions <clears throat> really must address power and knowledge imbalances. We need to really recognise the complexity of that cause and effect I was talking about. And we need to look across those interrelationships. Next slide, please. Across economic social and environmental indicators. But we also need good governance. We need cities to be based on a value system and we need to recognise identity and an overlapping uh, ecosystem. Uh, my colleagues in WCI will be familiar with this. I'm always trying to push this diagram. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> So thank you very much. I'm sorry that's been a bit of a race. Um, my conclusions are, can we create a new narrative of progress in the shadow of current and looming crisis? Uh, there are weak signals. There are hopeful signs of change emerging, such as Jeff Bezos. Guterres said, do we have a climate solidarity pack or a collective suicide pack? I think that's a very important question for cities to be asking themselves. Otherwise, we're living in Einstein's definition of insanity, which means doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome is insane. Cities, I believe, can be a major agent, major agent for change. And I think visions for the future are important, but we need visions for the future that are building, for me, that are building on where we sit here and now. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Kathy. Kathy is joining us from Chelsea, Gloucestershire, UK, right? Um, Gloucestershire. Yeah. And um, 
right now um, we would like to give way to um, Professor Francisco Javier Carrillo's presentation. All the floor is yours, Dr. Carrillo. Thank you, Blanca. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I'm just going to go through some notes I prepared when we first conceived of this session. And these notes are kind of a summary of a literature review on the state of the problem. Uh, the, the leading concept is stop living in the Holocene. So Chronicle has it that Nobel laureate Paul Krotzen first used the term Anthropocene at a climate conference in Cuernavaca, Mexico in February of the year 2000. <clears throat> Exacerbated as several scientists referred to dramatic planetary changes in the Holocene epoch, he interrupted the ongoing presentation shouting, stop saying the Holocene. We're not in the Holocene anymore. As all eyes were on him, expecting an alternative to be pronounced after a pause, he blurted out the name for a new epoch, the Anthropocene. While the term had been conceptually suggested before, this was the first time it was applied within a specific context. We are now in the geological epoch of human disruption of the biosphere at a planetary scale. As I hear diverse fashionable approaches to urban development, such as sustainable, smart, resilient cities, that basically take for granted the conditions of city life that allowed the emergence and continuance of cities during the Holocene, but are rapidly vanishing, I cannot help paraphrasing Krotzen by claiming stop living in the Holocene. The Holocene is the geological epoch that arose about 12,000 calendar years ago. It was characterized by unprecedented, stable, and favorable climate conditions for human development. The period corresponds to the rapid expansion of our species globally. The city epitomizes the modern human presence on Earth. No Holocene, no cities. And let's just recall David Dodman's uh, presentation earlier today. However, by far the largest portion of human history has been lived as nomads with distinctly different ways of relating to Earth. Homo sapiens sapiens appeared more than 300,000 years ago, but sedentary agriculture and permanent human settlements, two key precursors of urban civilizations, did not develop until only 10 to 12,000 years ago. That's about 3% of human history on Earth. So human activities made an unprecedented impact on the biosphere during the Holocene, resulting in current anthropogenic existential challenges to existence. It is very hard to anticipate how the Anthropocene will unfold, but we can tell that it is not going to get any better in terms of the state of the biosphere. As much as we can say, the changes are getting worse and faster by the day. This much we can tell. The Holocene has ended. Paradise is gone. Living conditions and consequently, biodiversity on Earth have already been severely disrupted up to a point of no return and continues to deteriorate fast. 
as COP27 unfolds, we learn that carbon emissions from fossil fuels, instead of being cut by half by 2030 to keep global warming with 1.5 degrees, will hit a record high this very year. We are likely to encounter several unprecedented challenges that threaten our ability to continue inhabiting this planet. As a result, urban foundations are liable to be shaken and disturbed. For example, the existence of endless supply resulting from indefinite growth is unlikely to be sustained. The provision of basic inputs such as food, water, and energy cannot be taken for granted anymore as it already happens in several of the world's regions. Cities are fragile complexes made up of, great, of a great variety of interconnected subsystems akin to car castles, each subsystem subject to unique risks. If several of these are disrupted simultaneously, the whole city life falls apart. We must critically examine the axiological and conceptual foundations of our cities and revise their environmental, economic, cultural, and political basis. As a result, it is necessary not only to question modern urban living, but also the whole way we inhabit our planet. Unless such an examination is conducted, no mitigation, adaptation or reform within a city will be effective. In essence, this means letting go of the very lifestyle that brought us here. It is time to say goodbye to the Holocene city. That is, goodbye to urban life as we know it. If there is going to be an urban life during the Anthropocene, we have yet to imagine it. I shall conclude by pointing out some condition, some conditions for post-urban life in the Holocene. First, a universal personal carbon budget. In terms of annual material consumption, this means eight metric tons as a sustainable global average, which is actually quite uh, uh, debatable. It may be rather lower. Current figure for the US is 23.7 tons, three times as much, and 52% more than the European average. In terms of global fossil, fossil fuel emissions, while, I quote, the richest 1% of the global population emits 17% of the total, the poorest half of the global population emits just 12%. This is from, from an Oxfam report. Every city shall have to abide to air system law. The, how, the now unavoidable net accountability leading to loss and damage responsibilities before international climate justice. A city cannot be subsidized by loss and damage to other earth beings, both human and not human. Every city must abide to the one planet cities canon. Also, a reordering of collective priorities. That is an economy of what matters. Consumerism, ostentatious living, irresponsible waste, luxury items, market-led innovation, linear product life cycle, heavy supply chains, costly current materials and practices will inevitably have to go. No more concrete, steel and stone. Also, deep innovation on the whole social metabolism, including biomimicry, urban agriculture, regenerative design, regional supply chains, 
self-sufficiency, radical circularity, and above all, the growth to any extent necessary. So-called arcology projects, that is all encompassing and self-constrained structures, move exactly in the opposite direction. Next, a whole redesign of the traditional urban layout at the proper scale, more in line with the recently discovered Neolithic megacities, which means no strong central administration, such as the, in the Tripila megasite, rather than walls and bunkers, open communities become more resilient and adaptive. Also, unprecedented adaptability and flexibility, such as they call provisional cities, rather than permanent ones. And I quote, we must, we must radically transform human settlements in a way that might enable us to adapt to and mitigate anthropogenic impacts. And first of all, to reinvent our Earth citizenship. Also, a reliance on community actionable knowledge management as the most effective means of agile adaptation and healthy city living. Reference was made earlier on to this project, Know Your City. And finally, a knowledge agenda for the Anthropocene for constantly discovering testing and learning flexible adaptive systems. I end by saying goodbye to you, to you all, yes, but also farewell to the Holocene city. I conclude. Thank you very much, um, Professor Carrillo, for this um, enlightening discourse, actually. Um, it's more than a presentation. And uh, we have already reflections uh, and applauses from <laughs> some of the audience, yes. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. Uh, this is the dynamics we will have here in this uh, breakout session. But I just don't want to, um, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, forget that we have a chat here and we already have a conversation there. Uh, yes, there's some, there's some, um, um, uh, congratulations for uh, Dr. Carrillo's birthday today, yes, but um, in fact uh, we have um, also um, some kinds of um, comments here, for instance, uh, uh, Beth Caniglia is with us today here in this breakout session and uh, she's commenting, for instance, so exciting, Kemi, I can't wait to see this model implement. Can you elaborate on what you mean by a cognitive city? Well, that will be a question for you, Kemi. Um, let's see if we have time. Let me just read um, more of the comments here. So you have more or less the temperature of what the thoughts of uh, this panel has provoked. Um, for instance, uh, again from Beth, uh, uh, sorry, Kathy is saying, what is the time scale of the NEOM development, that's Kathy to Kemi. Beth is asking to Kathy, I love the Garden City idea, Kathy. What a great graphic. Yes, I have lots of questions about the Garden City. Uh, Gunther is uh, mentioning about the survival of the richest, uh, that uh, yes, the um, WCI is uh, discussing about that particular idea. If you want to join us, uh, th there's um, uh, precisely the um, the link to a web page where you can join. Um, and um, there's also um, uh, uh, talking about more on garden cities. And uh, Beth is saying super powerful, Javier. You're right. We have to interrogate the axiological foundations of city life, our collective mission. And uh, yes, it's not only an excellent call to action, Javier, he just said goodbye to uh, uh, you know the basics of what we uh, have brought us here with the Anthropocene. So we need to say goodbye to that. So these are the the comments, and again, the a bit of the temperature 
of what we have in the room right now. Uh, I don't know if you would like to pose questions. The first, um, and this is my favorite, will be for you to um, pose questions to each other, but we can also follow uh, uh, some of the um, principles here in uh, the chat and maybe answer some of the questions already posed here. And of course, invite more of uh, the people in the in the room uh, to join us. I see that Rodrigo Trujillo is here with us, so we welcome him from Tenerife, precisely. And for Kemi, right? Um, um, actually, uh, I think they will have a big discussion on what could happen in the desert. I remember a presentation of Rodrigo um, a couple of years ago in this very context of the uh, Knowledge City Summit, right, in Floripa. And um, we had, um, you know, all, all those um, desert mosquitoes traveling from the northwest of Africa into Tenerife, generating a lot of uh, health issues, right? So we invite your participations. If you have poignant questions, please run to the chat, people, and we will read them out loud. Right now, we retake the question of Beth saying um, to Kemi, um, <clears throat> Can you elaborate on what you mean by a cognitive city? Thank you, Kemi. Uh, can you be brief? So we have a little bit more questions here. Um, and um, we keep on with the questions on the chat. Thank you, Kemi. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, Blanca. And um, such an enlightening uh, uh, panel um, and all of the uh, questions and challenges raised um, and posed. Um, when we talk about cognitive city, um, it's um, expanding on the concept of a smart city that basically leverages a lot of innovation and technology to deliver um, uh, solutions. Um, for instance, from um, um, biotechnology leveraging like innovations around uh, uh, biotech, uh, waste management, um, and so on. I think the, the difference with Cognitive City is how we leverage knowledge um, and our learning and lessons to sort of feed into, um, you know, coming up with a concept for that uh, for that city in a way that is sustainable, in a way that sort of is solution oriented uh, and it's fueled by innovation, basically. Uh, and if I may quickly take the other question in terms of the time scale for Neom. Uh, NEOM aligns with the Vision 2030 for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So the plan is that by 2030, a lot of all of the uh, uh, you know developments um, that we have embarked on should all be um, uh, you know uh, have been completed and uh, be ready to uh, be launched basically. Um, but beyond before that, um, for instance, we already have like some of the infrastructure ready um some of the uh, we're hosting some of the uh, winter games for instance in 2029 um in one of the regions um and so on so some of these things will be upstream before then but the the time scale is 2030 thank you thank you kemi and um i don't know if you want to expand a bit more kathy on the um uh, garden city concept which is um having an echo here in the chat uh, you also mentioned the 18-minute city. I don't know if that's linked. Uh, well, the Garden City concept, as I said, was was designed by uh, Ebenezer Howard back in 1859 or 89, um, designed to meet the challenge that people were leaving the land and going into the industrialised uh, city in, in huge volumes. So we've actually got the... The kind of opposite now people since the pandemic people are actually leaving the city um and looking for the suburban life uh because they can do all their work on on this but the question is in in uh europe the united states uh many of the developed countries cities are actually shrinking in terms of their population and therefore is there an opportunity to actually use that shrinkage for developing a much more balanced um, development between, you know, growing food, uh, green green for uh, keeping the temperature down, for nature-based solutions, et cetera. Uh, there are lots of pictures of, you know, old railways being turned into to gardens, et cetera. So the garden city um, kind of relates to, you know, we've been trying to get this 15-minute city, 
where we don't all have to commute into the centre to do our jobs. We live in uh, smaller communities in a bigger community. So that's the, that's the kind of concept and that old fashioned garden city idea developed a number of cities in the UK, actually. Well, in Garden City is a garden city. Um, but is it an appropriate model to just look at now and see how it might actually operate? Although it's for a different problem. It's for the opposite right. problem, in a sense. Thank you, Kathy. We'll give you uh, one minute each for you, uh, Gunter and um, Javier. Gunter, can you use your minute to give us some um, uh, final ideas of your presentation or of the um, uh, particular questions that we have been answering? Uh, well, time is too short to make yes. a, a long uh, <laughs> statement. I just uh, put it in the chat uh, to okay. uh, Kathy that uh, Vienna, which I use as a reference model, is a garden city. It's not only garden cities, it's a nature city. It's surrounded by vineyards, it's uh, by greens, by forests, etc. As much as I know, it's the one city is really having the largest uh, surface in, in having greens, as much as I'm informed. By the way, before we say goodbye, I just wanted to show a book which I just received. Ah, uh, Greta's, Greta's book. Mm -hmm which is received <laughs> today, just in time. Greta's book, yes. 450 pages. Oh. <laughs> you have it right Thank by tomorrow, you. Gunther. Um. Tell us all what's in it by tomorrow. Okay. Thank you, Gunther. Okay. Yes, I think we need to, to expand a lot more of what you presented as Europe's Green Deal. I think that's uh, what we can retain of uh, part of your presentation. And Dr. Carrillo, uh, one minute to say your final thoughts about your uh, participation or the discussion in this panel. Well, I just would like to leave, uh, to stress one idea, which is imagination. It is touched the phone uh, earlier today. And I think the challenge is not to look backwards what has been uh, happened before, because that's gone, that's ended, finished, finito. Now the challenge is what's coming up and how are we going to react? We don't know yet. We have to be prepared to improvise. We have to be to learn to be flexible and we have to do, learn to do it collectively at the global level. So uh, basically, this is what I would say. Let's us imagine, and particularly for the younger generation, let's just imagine what's, what has not yet happened in human civilization. Excellent. Well, we are right on time. And we want to say goodbye with the Mañanitas, whomever want to say. <laughs> and again, happy birthday, Dr. Carrillo. Let's enjoy the whole day on uh, this feast of knowledge moments. And I hope you really have tons of knowledge moments, or you all. Okay, have a good day and see you in the next event.